So we drew weeks for this Seven Deadly Sins series. <laughs> and I got lust and sloth. <laughs> I'm still trying to make sense of what that means, but I'll roll with it. My friend Angela is one of the ministers at our Unitarian Universalist Church in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And she recently preached a sermon with the title, Good Sex. She received a phone call from a Good Samaritan that week to the church office, and the church receptionist answered, and the person who thought they were doing the church a favor said, listen, I think the teenagers in the neighborhood have been messing around with your church sign. <laughs> and the receptionist at the church said, well, does it say the same thing on all three signs? person said, yes, it does. Does it say good sex? Yes. Well then, it's all good. Thank you very much for calling. <laughs> the person was concerned and trying to do them a favor because of the assumption that no church community could possibly preach a sermon about good sex. And why wouldn't that person be confused? So much of religion so much of the tradition out of which I came and many of you came has been used in a way that diminishes one of the core aspects of who we are as a human being. Relegating something natural, healthy, beautiful into something dirty or obscene. Now, I realize that in preaching a sermon with the title Lust and standing here with our church organ and choir, the hymns, the chancel, the pulpit, the robes and stoles. In some way, I have to contend with the fact that you are projecting onto me in this moment all that you've ever heard about sex and sexuality from anyone who stood wearing a robe and stole <laughs> hymnals with a church choir, organ, and chancel. So, if something's wrong, Blame it on them. <laughs> I understand that I will not get to what all of you want us to get to. We'll approach some things some of you wish we wouldn't and everything in between. First and foremost, I have to start with the disclaimer that this church is not and will need not be about shame in sexuality. We do not believe that shame is a necessary ingredient to have a healthy sexual life or to use our body in healthy relationship with other bodies. I need to tell you that we are a, quote, sex-positive religious tradition and congregation. So we teach a program called OWL. OWL is Our Whole Lives. It's a comprehensive, age-appropriate sex education class for our children and youth starting at ages six, going up through their teenage years, young adulthood, and non-adjective adulthood. I think we do a better job with the young people than we do with the adults around this. But our church is fully inclusive of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, asexual, intersex, and all labels that we associate with what it means to live into your full human sexuality. We've been inclusive for a long time and will fight to make sure that the entire world is. But that doesn't mean that we don't have assumptions about what it means to be in responsible, loving relationship with others. In the context of this sermon, when I say lust, here's what I mean. The habit, the habitual practice of requiring that other human bodies and the institutions they make up must be perfect, unchanging, and really only meant for my pleasure. For me, this habit is a thing that turns people and institutions into objects and is a consumptive way of viewing the world. All of you really exist just for me, and I will cast you aside if you're not perfect and unchanging and don't continue doing what I need you to do. And I think a big problem in religion comes when people equate lust with sexual desire. To say that the mere fact of desire is somehow sinful or wrong. 
However, since so much of what we mean when we talk about lust and what I assumed you thought we were going to talk about when the sermon started is around our bodies in relationship of one body to another, I've been reflecting on what the first messages I learned about my body and sexuality were. When I was eight or nine years old and really began to understand that one day I would be maybe in a relationship like this. And here's what I remember learning. I remember learning during my era some very conflicted values about my body and sexuality. Now, people my age grew up in a time that was not the restrictive age of the 40s and 50s culturally, nor was it the era of free love and reacting against restrictive societies. My generation is actually looking for structure, community support, we trust institutions and their leaders. But I grew up in an era in which Mr. Rogers told me he loved me and everybody else did, in which I was free to be you and me. My parents told me that my body was good, natural, that the bodies of my gay and lesbian brothers and sisters were good and natural, that sex was a healthy part of human life. And yet, during that moment of becoming aware at eight or nine years old, for me, it was also during the height of the AIDS crisis. We didn't know much about what the results of this would be. Certainly, there was no thought of a cure then. And so I was taught the conflicting message that my body was good, whole, to be used in relationship with someone that I loved, but if I didn't do it with the right person, a clean person, if I didn't marry them first, there's a good chance I would die. Your body is whole, good, natural, and loving. It's very dangerous. I was also brought up in an era in which, rightly, our society had decided that we might start wanting to educate young boys about the oppression and injustice that men have brought to women in our society and others for too long. We started to teach young boys that it was time for mental, verbal, physical, sexual abuse of women to stop. But a way that that happened in my era was that young boys, eight or nine or ten, were kind of often taken into a separate room or classroom and said, hey, look, this is a problem. We want to catch you before you turn into a man. <laughs> this is, I mean this, right? This is a problem, and if you don't stop yourself now, you will be dangerous, particularly to women. So while I had Mr. Rogers, and I was free to be you and me, while my parents told me that sexuality was loving and lovable, natural, and embraced a wide variety of gender and sexual identities, I, I took the implicit message away that as a young man growing up, my body was dangerous, and sex itself was dangerous. Now, if that's the lesson I got, in one of the most privileged bodies our society has. White, straight, able-bodied male of a middle-class cl household. If that's the image and lesson I took away, I cannot imagine what everybody else learned. It must have been complicated. And if lust is ultimately turning people into things so that we can consume them, then our culture does a very good job of helping us do just that. Again, I'm speaking from my individual experience as a straight man in this society, but I have to fight off every day the not-so-subtle education that bodies are commodities to be bought and sold, particularly women's. Women's bodies are used to sell things from hamburgers to trucks. We parade them out to entertain us at many of our events. When people get married in heterosexual relationships, we still, at the beginning of those ceremonies, often talk about giving someone to someone else. And women's bodies are, need to be touched up in order to be appropriate and lovable in our consumer society. On top of that, one of the primary labels I ever wear as a human in America is consumer. Consumer Satisfaction Index, Consumer Confidence Index. The president 
calls me a consumer more often than a citizen or a neighbor. So it's not a big stretch for me to believe that people are products. That if the people I am in relationship with or love are not perfect, unchanging, and meant for my pleasure, I should move on to another one. And one thing I don't think that we have talked about yet is where this tradition of the seven deadly sins came out of. Maybe this is a week I miss, but I don't think that we've talked about that yet. What we call the seven deadly sins were originally understood as seven deadly vices. And this is very different. They were understood as habits, not something innately wrong and sinful in you, not a moment of trespass against your neighbor, but rather habits that over the course of a lifetime, day after day, moment after moment, week after week, I could choose the lesser good or God. Whereas the virtue would be a habit of choosing the greater good or God. And they came out of experiences of desert monastics in the two, three, and four hundreds of the common era. During the height of the Roman Empire, its excesses, there were people who said, I'm done with this. I'm giving up all that I have, and I'm going out in the desert to pray for a few years. Desert fathers and mothers, they're called. And often these people would go out and live in a cave for years by themselves, eating a single bowl of rice or something similar to that, living alone for years in a cave or the wilderness before they came back to community. And the seven deadly vices came out of this context of them in these moments of solitary prayer saying, Wow, all this stuff's kind of coming up in my mind. I need to reflect on this. And they categorized these things, which then became pastoral care categories. So that priests could say, yeah, what you're struggling with is called gluttony. So if a man alone in a cave, 1,700 years ago, for two years eating a bowl of rice a day, is struggling with things like lust, gluttony and pride, and he did not have Oreos and a cell phone, (laughs) and I do, why would there be any shame in our struggles? I think when we talk about lust and sexual ethics, it's far too easy for religions, progressive religions, particularly ours, to blame one religion for all of our problems, or to think that another religion or its alternative would, would solve all of our problems. The same Judeo-Christian tradition that gave us good old St. Augustine and original sin and so much shame and oppression and injustice around people's bodies, that same tradition is the one that gave us the Song of Songs that we read and worship this morning. This is a love poem, and I'd like you to go back and read it on your own. Choose the New Revised Standard Version. Read it on your own because I didn't feel comfortable reading all of it to you. (laughs) This is a love poem that seems to be about a multiracial couple, unmarried, and their desire for one another out in the field. It starts with the narrator, a woman, saying, Do not blame me, I am black and beautiful. Do not use that against me with my partner. They get into descriptions about what it means to be in physical relationship that I promise the Highland Park Parents Association would have censored (laughs) if they didn't know it was in the Bible. (laughs) Religious traditions have split entirely over one sentence of theology. And yet one thing that Jews, Protestants, and Christians seem to agree on is that this explicit love poem should be considered scripture in all of their traditions. There's something that says it's okay for us to have longing for one another and one another's bodies as an expression of God. On the other hand, we shouldn't believe that Unitarian Universalism is the salve that will take all of our complications away or that the lack of religion would do so either. So Channing Hall, our fellowship hall, is named after the Reverend William Ellery Channing, the father of American Unitarianism. 
He's one of the first people to call us Unitarians in the early 1800s in Boston. My professor, Tandeka, in seminary showed us some of his journals in which he wrote that he was deeply ashamed of his effeminate body and that he was having inappropriate sexual desires. What is a man in the early 1800s who believes that he is too effeminate and having inappropriate sexual desires struggling with? Our tradition affirmed, and he affirmed, that the presence of God in human beings, the entire presence of the holy itself moving in us was our ability to reason. God was in our head. No wonder a man struggling with so much shame around his body would promote a religious notion that says your spirituality is what happens from your neck up. He's also our ancestor. But the reason why lust is important for us today is not because of some small-minded notion of what it means to be a sexual human being. I'm not going to prescribe any course of action for you. The reason lust is important to us as Unitarian Universalists is because our faith is entirely 100% rooted in the notion that right relationship is what saves us. We're not orthodox, we don't have right beliefs. We're not orthoprax, we don't have right practices. We're a covenantal religion that believes that right relationship is what makes us whole and healed. Particle physics and our holy texts tell us the same thing. All of reality is interrelated. Every single atom in the known universe is in relationship with every other atom in the known universe. I listened to a story on the radio just a few weeks ago about scientists who were able to figure out how to manipulate one atom and have it be changed miles and miles away in its partner atom. They believe that this dance is happening all over the universe. It questions free will entirely. But what it also does is says all of us are deeply in relationship whether we want to be or not. You and I have mirror neurons in our brains. And literally when I smile or frown, when I weep or jump up with joy, it literally produces emotional experiences in you whether you want them to or not. We are connected in holy, profound ways that make sense for me to call God. And so for us, being in right relationship is the goal. For me, lust, the habit of turning people into objects, the habit of requiring that people be perfect just as I want them to be, unchanging, and really only existing for me, diminishes my capacity to have right relationship with others, and therefore to experience God. And for me, the problem is that something so in tuned in us, something so deeply embedded in what it means to be a human being, our sexuality, ends up translating into almost every other area of my life. If I'm taught that women, for me especially, are only valuable if they exist for my pleasure, are perfect, and never change, not only is that an injustice, but I'm going to start believing that every relationship I'm a part of better be for me, better be just as I want it to be, and better not ever change if it's meant to be good. We start to lust after institutions and families. We would never say to our partner, or shouldn't, that they should be shamed for not having the body at 70 that they did at 30. And yet, we would say of a church, well, this place is not the same one I joined 40 years ago. That lust, that consumption can lead us to believe that a religious community is really meant just for me, should change just for me, and if I don't like it, I should go away. I grew up in an era when we interview our children's pediatricians, their schools, when I was told that if you don't like something, you should leave. Some of this is right. 
But I know how easy it is to form a habit of treating every relationship I have as a product that ultimately exists for my pleasure alone. It sounds silly to say, but the antidote to consumption through lust is love. No amount of being right all by itself is going to make you and me loving and loved. No amount of doing the right thing or avoiding the wrong thing is going to make you and me loving and loved. In some strange, utterly simplistic understanding, loving is the only thing that makes us loving and being loved. Right relationship is ultimately what heals our broken parts and makes us whole. Here we are, creatures who exist in a universe based entirely on relationship. We are creatures hardwired, built for relationship itself. And in a world that is difficult enough to live in already, why would we practice anything that restricts our ability to love? As creatures built for relationship, if we practice a way of living that consumes the human beings around us, we will at the very least be disappointed and at the worst be utterly lonely, even in a crowd. Love invites mystery. Love says that there is more to other people than just me. Love is a path towards surprise, mystery, wonder, challenge, new learning, and new life. This is the love that I think teachers talk about as being a name for God. This is a love where we find life and live it more abundantly. It is possible to practice loving imperfect, changing creatures who do not exist just for us. And strangely enough, if we practice this week after week, we will know life and know it more abundantly in all its holy ways. This love is the doctrine of our church. May it be so. Amen.